everyone, welcome to Eat the Magic Escapade Edition. Just because the parks are closed doesn't mean we don't have things to talk about, and this time we are talking about... We are talking about Muppets at Walt Disney World. This was a special aired on NBC during the Magical World of Disney in May of 1990. This was Jim Henson's last project before he passed. Um, he, Jim Henson did do the voice work for Kermit the Frog and among others for the Muppet 3D vision, but he never lived to see the final product, but this was like one of his last projects he actually worked on and lived to see the day of. Yeah. And I think I may have seen it when I was a little, little kid. I can't say for sure, but it seems like something like my mom and I did watch the wonderful world of Disney and I was a huge Muppet fan. So I don't see how I would have missed that when I was young. I remember they used to rerun this all the time on the Disney Channel, so I probably would like just maybe like catch it once or twice a year, and I revisited again um, a couple years ago. It's like yeah, I just kind of want to binge through like just some old Disney specials focusing on on the Disney theme parks. So I have like a love hate relationship with with this one, but just kind of just looking back at it, like looking at it with a perspective, knowing that. This was one of was Jim Henson's last Muppet project, and also having gone to Disney World, we just watched it again just to kind of um like yeah let's just uh watch it talk about it and also because of um self quarantine we've been going through a lot of the Muppet movies on Disney Plus and Amazon Prime for some reason Muppets Takes Manhattan is on Amazon Prime the rest of the Muppet movies are on Disney Plus so we just kind of went over um. What was it? Just a couple of things on um on the Disney Plus just kind of keep us company. And then I was like, hey, no, let's um, review the uh, the time when the Muppets go to Disney World. Yeah, and the general premise is that Kermit brings all the Muppets over to the Florida swamps to visit his family for a frog festival. And of course, as soon as the Muppets find out that they're right next to Disney World, they have to go to Disney World. And then they have shenanigans. And everyone learns a valuable lesson about the magic of friendship. Indeed, they do. Also, uh, let's see. We we ended up watching this. Like, we just kind of had to like just search around for it. I believe like you can find it on YouTube. That's where we watched it. Uh, no, we watched it on Vimeo. The full thing's oh. on Vimeo, but if it's <clears> on YouTube, there is a version of it, but it's separated into different parts. Okay. So if you just kind of do some Google searching, like for videos, search uh, Muppets at Walt Disney World. Like, yeah, you can find it. It's none of those uh, specials that have um, been uploaded to Disney Plus, though I think it would be a fun addition to add in on there, especially if you get like the beginning part with Michael Eisner interacting with Fozzie and Fozzie's mom, who I keep forgetting exists because I remember Fozzie's mom more from the uh, Christmas special, and I forgot she was in the special. Yeah, because she doesn't show up like in any of the movies, or if she does, I don't remember her. But she does show up in a lot of the specials and probably on the original Muppet Show if I watched more episodes of that. Is the, do you know if the uh, original Muppet Show is on Disney Plus? I do not. I have not searched for it. I have not searched for it either, but that's something I'd like to eventually go through now that I have all this uh, free time on my hands during self quarantine. <laughs> you know what I want to watch again, and I'm afraid doesn't hold up? Muppet Babies. Yes, uh, there is a version of Muppet Babies on Disney Plus, but that's the uh, reboot version. Oh, I want the real one where they cut to clips from like various movies all of which disney owns now it's so weird because muppet babies was my intro to star wars and indiana jones yep they also have a, a really good wizard of oz version they tell and i think they do the Maltese falcon in one episode i don't remember that one but if you gave me the gave me the general plot point like okay i probably well, remember that it was, one. It was one it was one where like kermit was like a detective I think I thought maybe it was Melty's Falcon. But it was one of the like detective movies from like the uh, 30s, 40s. I do remember the African Queen one. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. It may have been the African Queen. Uh, and then they had ones just dealing with like little random issues kids had to deal with, like the earthquake one or the one where like they think Nanny is making them disgusting food, but it turns out it's just glue because she wants to feed them glue and stuff them. Or Nanny's was it Brussels sprouts or something? No, they, they kept thinking of what type of the horrible food was because they heard her saying some ingredients, but it turns out it was like glue for the new wallpaper. Oh, I see. Yeah. I don't have recollection of that one. There's the dentist episode. Yes, I do remember. They had the drilling song. 
Yeah. And all, all freaked out. And then the dentist was like, not that big a deal. And then Kermit's like, I want to go to the dentist. And it's like, you don't have any teeth. It's like, yeah. Shouldn't I talk to a dentist about that? And it was like, that's a pretty good joke. Muppet humor is always very witty. I really like a lot of the um, old school like Muppet humor. Because I tried watching the new ABC Muppets uh, TV series. Show. No, 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 no. That's not how you do it. It just feels so dry. It feels so bland. It's because they're trying to do The Office with the Muppet characters. And it's like trying to fit a circle peg into a square hole. It doesn't work. I remember I saw the recent Muppet movie of... Uh, released a couple years ago in theaters it was okay. I, yeah i liked it for what it was it was a nostalgia trip but then i tried watching muppets most wanted and i didn't really care for it and that was the one where i think i walked in made like yelled a few things about how crap it was and then immediately left the room the only thing it's really given us was the um evil kermit memes yeah and that's about it oh no 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 i think that was during one of our project days wasn't it mm-hmm. i didn't leave the room i just kept bitching about it the entire time so yeah, let's focus in on Muppets at Walt Disney World. So this whole thing opens up with Michael Eisner um, hanging out with Fozzie's mother and Fozzie over to Grand Floridian and they're having a little tea party. Do you think Bob Chapik would do something like this? No, but neither would Iger. They don't have any sense of humor about themselves. And that's one thing you'll find Eisner in a lot of these specials, either hanging out with Mickey Mouse or... In fact, I think in one, one of them, does he say that Mickey's his boss? Yes. And so it's like, that's the kind of personality he had was he knew what he needed to do was humanize himself to the audience. You can't think of him as some sort of, you know, mega corporation leader. You need to think of him as, hey, that guy, you know, loves this just as much as I do. And he has a good sense of humor about it. And he wants to you know, see the Muppets integrated nicely into the park. And I appreciate that about Bob. Too many Bobs, <laughs> too many. I hate this. Eisner. I'm going to go for last names from now on. It's one of the things I do appreciate about Eisner is that he really did have that sense of humor about himself. He did play it up like the person in charge of all of Disney was Mickey Mouse, not him. And there was a lot of great that came out during his era. And while he made some mistakes, and that's a whole discussion in and of itself, of the, uh, you know, three leaders we've had in a row here, Eisner is the best by far. And I think he'll be the best remembered and probably most revered of the group because his mistakes don't outweigh his triumphs. While Iger's, you know, mistakes clearly outweigh his triumphs and Chapek is a joke. I'm really afraid to see how how Disney's going to go with Chapek, but that's another topic for another day. Yeah, between Chapek and the virus and everything this is this is not gonna be a good year for disney and eiser just has a nice sense of humor about himself like oh no i spilled tea on myself and like the, the rest of the muppet gang are like well how about and they just completely maul him at the grand floridian mm-hmm. where he's like no i can just go to the cleaners it's fine no 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 we should clean it's all over him totally gets dogpiled by muppets yeah. <laughs> so this whole thing opens up after the uh that cold open with the Muppet gang going into the swamps of Florida. There's a bug festival that Kermit wants to take his gang to. And then they find out (laughs) the cute, cute little opening song here. And then the Muppets aren't very enthused on the prospects of eating bugs and mosquitoes. They're not very acclimated to frog culture, shall I say. Well, yeah. And the fact that they're all just walking through a swamp, just not even, it's not one of those like, Oh, it's a little, shack by the no 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 they're just i mean it's a set but it's it's designed to look like that there's a talking alligator and everything yeah alligator puppet was pretty cute uh-huh. <laughs> and it's like yeah yeah like and the, and then his his um, country bumpkin redneck cousins are all like yeah and once everything's all done we watch a fireworks from disney world and everyone just just drops everything and like hey look at the walt disney world behind those trees which is the matte painting well, because they obviously did things in the regular studio that they work in and then brought only a handful of them over to uh, the park for, you know, closed shooting here and there. Now, you and I, we've been to Disney World recently for the first time last year. I remember watching this as a kid, just kind of like thinking like, oh, everything is just all seamless, seamlessly together. That would be pretty cool if it was. And then like just as an adult, you're watching this. You have, like, this plot point where Miss Piggy wants to go to the Chinese theater, which is in the 
right in the dead center of MGM Studios. It was the first thing we saw when we went to Disney World. Yeah, they enter through the gates of MGM, so all she has to literally do is walk forward. And she's there, no problem. But then Beauregard, you might know him from The Great Muppet Caper as the cab guy, just takes her to all the e-ticket rides, which I find hilarious. Yeah, like, like instead of just leading, leading her to where she needs to go, Beauregard's just like, but... I want to go on the mine train. I want to go on Star Tours. I want to go on Well, it would have been um, Big Thunder Mountain. It's mine oh, train Big Thunder didn't Mountain. exist. Okay. Sorry about then. that. It's all right. It's, ni- it's 1998 Disney World. We wouldn't really have a perspective of it because the first time we went to Disney World was last year. Yeah. And I didn't go on their Big Thunder Mountain, I don't think. No, we didn't because even if we wanted to, it just started to rain the whole day and they closed off a yeah, lot of a the lot um, of outdoor, outdoor rides. Outdoor rides yeah. That's something I wasn't quite aware of like oh by the way like when it rains all day we're gonna close all of, all of our outdoor I, rides and i think it's because they're, they have a lot of thunderstorms and they did over there i mean that thunder gets loud and if lightning hits the ride or something like that that could be a major liability it would have been fun to do jungle cruise in the rain that would have been awesome but okay so uh yeah so every muppet basically divides off to have their own little sub story so Beauregard and Piggy are basically hitting e-ticket rides with Miss Piggy and not enjoying it whatsoever. Um, eventually concluding with them being uh, brought into the Indiana Jones stunt show, which it becomes one of the big highlights of the whole thing. Yeah, let's kind of go through some of these uh, plot threads. So the main yeah. thread is Kermit just trying to gang up, not gang up, trying to like just round back back everyone up together again to make it in time. To the for, festival. Mm-hmm. And then they're ha- they have to deal with the security guard because... Muppets are going to Muppet. They're going to like, uh, paying for tickets for Disney World. We're just going to ram right through the uh, turnstile. And so, then yeah. the uh, security guard played by Charles Grodin, who was Nikki in The Great Muppet Caper, makes a return as a derpy Disney security guard. And he teams up with Rizzo the Rat to try to find all the Disney people, not Disney people, all the Muppets and, you know, put them in Disney jail, I guess. It is a thing. Yeah, and Kermit gets disheartened, runs into Raven Simone, little baby Raven Simone from like the Cosby show, which is adorable. She is just a ball of little tiny talent. She's like, hey, Kermit, I know a song. Let's sing the Rainbow Connection. And it's so cute. It made me feel so happy. It's That's adorable. You were singing happy. along, and I know you're not the type to sing along because you have no heart. Yeah, but that song has like a lot of meaning to me. And we recently were, wa- were watching the Muppet movie over the weekends like, I forgot how feelsy this movie really made me feel. Yeah. It's one of those reasons, like, oh, that's probably why I don't watch it too often, because, like, I know, like, at the end, I'm going to cry, and I'm going to, like, As as everyone gets back together to sing Rainbow Connection at the very end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially that epilogue part, because, like, that still hits me as an adult. (laughs) But it's a fun movie. Highly recommend if you haven't seen it yet. Yeah, even if you did, go back and rewatch it. It's, it's, it holds up. Because Jim Henson was a freaking genius. And then, yeah, you have, like, this cute moment between Raven Simone and um, Kermit just kind of walking by Cinderella Castle, just singing the Rainbow Connection. And then you also have this moment where uh, Charles Grodin's uh, security um, guard guy is like, I'm going to round up my, the best men I know. And he rounds up the seven dwarves and refer to him refer to them as his SWAT team. Which is pretty kind of awesome. And it was a great... Comedic choice, just to have the seven dwarves. I want to see fan art of, like, the seven dwarves looking all badass. <laughs> like, looking like SWAT people. <laughs> just all, like, just pumped up and everything. One of them needs an axe. Or dwarves. <laughs> One should have an axe. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, another one of the um, plot points I like, like, even though it was pretty brief, um, I didn't get the joke as a kid, but, like, when you and I were like watching it as adults, like, oh, ha, ha, ha. it's when Electric Mayhem decides to do a world tour around World Showcase. It opens up with them on the long gone um, double decker bus that used to run through World Showcase. And then Dr. T's like, hey, what does every rock band want to do? Animal shows up. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. Other than that. <laughs> That joke flew flew over me as a kid, and then you made a salacious kind of like yeah th- yeah that's, getting groupies well, drugs. <laughs> that's basically what I said before Animal popped up, and then Animal pops up like yeah yeah me and Animal are in the same wavelength here. Uh, being the son of a a rock musician, I have a general idea of what every rock musician wants. And uh, <clears throat> 
And then, you know, Dr. Teeth basically goes like, no, man, a world tour. And we could world tour here and end up getting home for dinner. And I'm like, getting home for dinner? It's World Showcase. Choose Check a- around the world. <laughs> Choose a place. <laughs> You're rock musicians. Beer in Germany. Cervezas at uh, Mexico. Yeah, we've got some options here, man. But And they, they play a little song about rock and roll, which is, like I said. Rocking around the world. Which, which I said, it's going to be three weeks from now, and this is going to get stuck in my head. I have no idea what it's from. That was a pretty awesome song. It's pretty neat. And you also have, like, the small world children show up in face character, in, like, mascot character outfits. If you didn't think the small world dolls were creepy, <laughs> this takes it to another level. And just... It only happens for one second. They sing sing a quick line from It's a Small World. Yeah, at the very they, end. They show up, like, in the Mexico Pavilion, and you have the life-size Small World dolls. And I'm like, okay. I, small World never really bothered me, but I know it bothers a lot of people. <laughs> this will freak you out. This, this will, like, this is nightmare fuel. <laughs> this will be your nightmare fuel. I mean, Midsommar was my nightmare fuel last night. This will be your nightmare fuel. Um, so... Electric Mayhem then just kind of, kind of is gone for the majority of the story. After that, with the exception of Animal, who sees Snow White and then chases her all around the freaking parks. She chases Snow White from Magic Kingdom all the way to MGM Studios, concluding at the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular. Yeah. So what do they do? Just like get on the boat to, from like. <laughs> As he's still just sitting there going like Snow White, Snow White, Snow White. And they're like, oh, this is not going to end well for Snow White. <laughs> Uh, so that, that was kind of a fun thing, a little bit of risque humor there, which which you need of the Muppets. That's part of the Muppets. I mean, one of the first Muppet specials they did before they even had the Muppet show was called Muppet Sex and Violence. Oh, no, it's the, it's the original pilot. It was called Sex and Violence. And it was just the Muppets doing violent stuff and making crass jokes. And now you have Puppet Up for, you know, the exact same thing. Yeah, Puppet Up is amazing. If you have a chance to watch it in your area, we highly recommend it. So, uh, continuing on, let's see who else is there. There is uh, there's a lot of characters, only have really brief moments. Like, Swedish Chef just opens up a stand in, in uh, Mexico. Mexico in the it's Mexico like Pavilion. Swedish tacos or something, and he does his Swedish Chef thing. He's like, I got all these hot sauce and rubber fra. Put on Fergan Fergan. Put on Fergan Fergan. Put on Fergan Put on Fergan Fergan. And then Beaker uh, decides to try it because there's like this weird, funky plot point. Where Bunsen and Beaker, and Beaker has, like, this pail stuck to his head, and they're trying to get rid of that pail off his head. And again, this one also kind of just disappears off the main story as well. Like, you couldn't have Bunsen and Beaker just, like, doing something at Epcot. Because it feels like so many Epcot options for them to mess around with and break. Because I felt like there's a lot of Ooh, misopportunity there. Tomorrowland. Breaking stuff in Tomorrowland would have been great. <laughs> I always liked them as a comedy duo. And... So, you know, of course, Beaker eats the taco and it's too hot and, his, you know, the bucket shoots off his head. <laughs> it just kind of, yeah, that kind of plot point for that all kind of just was little little mini vignettes. We have a through line with Gonzo and Camilla uh, basically separating from the group, going into the Utilidors, which is kind of cool seeing the Utilidors. And it's really cool, like, from a made up perspective, just seeing, like, the whole laundry process over at um the at the disney world resort yeah where they're, they're goofing around with that as well but i kind of would like to see if they, if they could want w- would um add more context to that because i remember as a kid like why is he going through the laundry mat here like i feel like we could be somewhere else and i kind of felt like i just kind of felt like yeah like show that you're there you till doors show that like you cast members just kind of like just walking by going to their next land it because fe- it felt like, like a perfect opportunity for him to run into someone and it's like where, where, where are we it's like oh you're in the utila doors these are special corridors under walt disney world that allow uh, that allow cast members to get to where they need to be it's like an underground wow, city it's like an underground city yeah some could say that what's that over there oh my gosh a laundry uh yeah i Oh, what We're a just weird seeing, guy. seeing like, Gonzo just popping his head out in different manholes of like the Magic Kingdom. It, it would have been nice Disney to see that world. as well. Like, there's some options where they could have had a lot more fun with that, and they just kind of didn't. They just kind of focus on the laundry. It's good to know where all the cast member clothes. Like again, like from a behind the scenes per- perspective, like eh, that's kind of pretty neat. But at the same time, I'm like, I just feel there's so much more you can do with Gonzo. Yeah. 
meanwhile, Fozzie and his mom want to go get some food and they realize they don't have any money. So Fozzie's mom forces Fozzie to perform. And of course, he does his bad jokes. And of course, Statler and Waldorf find him because they have to. And leads to some really good uh, one-liners from Statler and Waldorf. And eventually Kermit does find Fozzie and leads him into the Country Bears so that he can kind of have a, a more receptive audience. You just meet the right audience. audience and yeah. he meets the Country Bears. Mm-hmm. I love the Country Bears. It was something like, because that's what I thought they were going to do. I'm like, oh, now Fozzie and his mom are just going to run into the Country Bears. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's my cousins. And then you have like a whole Fozzie if the Country Bears, you know, silliness section instead of just Fozzie Bear just kidding impromptu com- comedy show and then being made fun of and I'm like no could have done so much more of him than the country bears could have gone and said like well if you guys are a band you need an opening act like a comedian walker walker like it would have been great yeah I'm just kind of seeing that integration to country bears attraction because I kind of felt they spent too much time like outside of like things to do at the park and kind of focused more like just using the park as a backdrop for, like, a typical, like, Muppets kind of skit, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it, it basically felt like they were just doing Muppet skits with that as a background instead of... Like, that's the reason I think the, uh, Miss Piggy's adventures stand out is because she was going on the rides. And my horrible sadness when I finished watching the Star Tours section, it was like two minutes later, I go, oh, man, that was the perfect opportunity for a pigs in space joke, and I didn't even, didn't even do it. So next to me, watch this. If you're your friends... When they're in that section, you have to go, pigs in space. And I'll admit, it was, I felt like really nostalgic seeing like the old Star Tours ride footage of the oh, Death Star yeah, runs. Like, sure. yeah, I miss you, Trench Run. <laughs> and I also like at the end when Bowie Girl's like, but what about Space Mountain? Body Wars. Like, oh, yeah, I, I've never... We've never done body wars. Well, because I never didn't go to, then grew up on the East Coast. Yeah, uh, now it's going to be the uh, the uh, Guardians uh, roller coaster. I still lament missing Universe of Energy. That's a catchy song. Yeah. And you always have to make reference to it anytime we're at the Nemo submarines. Yep. So does Dorgan tell us about the Universe of Energy? So for those who are, are West Coast people who don't know much about the East Coast stuff... At Epcot, they had a attraction called Universe of Energy, starring Ellen DeGeneres, basically explaining to you how, like, energy works. And it has a catchy theme song, and I, I assume it's just one of those sit down and watch a video things? It's a ride. Oh, is it a ride? Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. So now I miss it even more. And I never got to go on it, but for some reason it became, like, my running joke. And I can't fully explain it in a way that would make it sound sane. So it's just one of my crazy running jokes. Just look up Universe of Energy and you can find a lot of history to videos on it. Universe of Energy. It's a catchy song. Meanwhile, I've, I've had New Horizons stick in my head. I'm trying to think of who else had a shenanigan adventures before we get to the finale. With uh, Sour Waldorf. They um, found <laughs> sure. an old lady they decided to sit next to and they sang a song to her. They did that. They also, like, had, of course, their introduction is great where they're talking about how great Disney World is and how, like, that's why they hate it because there's nothing to complain about. <laughs> there's nothing to complain about here. Ugh, it makes us terrible. Hate it. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, there's some witty um, stuff between the two of them. And then eventually they meet up with Fozzie and they start heckling Fozzie because Fozzie's like, well, I'm glad there's those old heckler guys aren't here. Like, they're yes, there. Yes, we are, bear. And I also like their summer variant out- outfits, too, because they're wearing these powder blue, like, old people suits. It's, it's so dapper. I love it. Yeah, it's just it's just their variation, but made for, like, it's summer vacation. It's great. I kind of want to do that as my next bound. Just have us doing powder blue outfits as Statler and Waldorf with summer hats. Because um, Dapper Day, um, they actually now have a summer date for Disneyland because of the whole... Uh, virus shutdown thing screwed up a video i wanted to make there that's okay uh, we Thanks can always virus. do it sometime yeah, other time it's not the same if i can't be around all the dapper people that was supposed to be part of the joke i'm with the rich people now oh oh i shall join you in your your pitiful little fight but first i will continue to enjoy myself at the disneyland resort here's my mickey bar chomp <laughs> chomp yeah, Mickey oh, Bars this... were uh, sold back in um, Florida in 1990 yeah, for $1.50. Did you see Animal reading a bunch of Mickey Bars? To me, yeah, of course he would. And then you made the comment like, yeah, that was like me, but with the moonshine or sunshine day bar. 
No, that it's... grenadine was really awesome, though. Well, grenadine is always awesome because it's non-alcoholic. It's just a delicious raspberry syrup. I always mix into my drink. I forgot what it's called, but I really enjoyed it. You can see our review on Sunshine Day Bar on our channel. Um, no, my, my joke was... Hey, remember the remember the day when I was acting exactly like that? Because <laughs> I do get my days where I'm like, all I want is some freaking ice cream. Disneyland ice cream is one of my favorite foods. Maybe because it's like one of the rare good times I've had with my mom. Or maybe just because it's really delicious or some combination thereof. Made by dryers. And it, But it tastes better than like if you get the dryers, you know, cartons. And I don't know how they make it taste better. Well, one of our, let's if have one of our... Disney magic, I will punch you in the face. No, I was just going to say, like, well, maybe the first thing we should do when we when the parks open again, let's just head over to um, Clarabelle's or um, Gibson Girl and just grab ourselves some ice cream. Ooh, or Burbank. Uh, no. But my mom and I used to go to Burbank all the time in the early 2000s. No, it's Clarabelle's, connected to Fiddler and Fife, a but... practical cafe. No, it's uh, Clarabelle's. It's that cow that... It, is... No, it was like a train. It's a clever clever train with a pun uh, I did like the train motif. I just, no, I'm not just... a fan of the pun motif. Oh. I... I do admit that a train station facade was a pretty cool motif. I really liked it. It reminds that. me of Victoria Station when it used to be at Universal Studios Hollywood. A place I believe I ate at with my dad. Because I remember eating it. The Rock my... Dad. Yeah, with Rock Dad. I have a very interesting backstory, people. You probably wish I would just do a whole episode that's my backstory, but it would have so little Disney involved. It would make You're no still, sense to be part of this it'll be mostly uh, Universal Studios Hollywood because Elvira be. is also involved in this. Yes, she is. She's part of my backstory. I have an awesome backstory, people. So, yeah, you have uh, Jay here. His father's a rock star. And you Elvira. Yeah, just do some math. Well, there's no guarantee that that ever happened, but if it did, I, I do need to high five my dad. Uh, but anyhow, <laughs> most awkward conversation to have with her. So speaking of rock stars, <laughs> Rolf goes to the kennel. Yes. And he's captured by kennel people. He sees the facility and he's just trying to ask them a question and they immediately just toss, they put a net over him and just put him directly in the thing. And he's just jail performing for all the, uh, all the dogs. And uh, Disney World does have a kennel. It's actually not too far from um, the Port Orleans uh, Resort. Because I remember when I was looking at the resort map, I was like, oh, hey, they have a kennel. That's where Rolf probably was. <laughs> It'd be one of those weird little kind of things. but Because it's something I never would have thought of. But then it makes perfect sense. Because how many families are taking road trips, bringing the dog along, and like, oh, we want to go to the park. We don't want to, like, leave. they can't leave the dog in the hotel or... Or cabin if you're at Wilderness Resort or something. So, yeah, you, you put them in the kennel. Then you take them out to go run around, you know, Orlando. The most run aroundable city in... Huh. Well, um, you know, if you were still, like, road tripping and you brought your dog with you and you're going to do a day or two at Disneyland or <laughs> Disney World, you may as well have a nice little kennel there. Like, I don't know. It just seems like something that was a really smart idea for them to have. And I'm sure it gets a lot of use. Maybe less so now that everyone can get a piece of paper that says they can take their dog anywhere. But back in the day specifically, I think it would have gotten a lot of use. Plus, and Rolf's I, song was great. And I also like the uh, dog uh, puppets there. Mm -hmm. And I was making the comments like, hey, how many of these dogs got reused for Dog City? I, like, I, I think a couple probably. <laughs> Yeah, I just like the puppetry because they puppetry work, and I like the um, attention to detail because, like, oh, you see all the different dog breeds, you see them in, like different outfits. I, I just thought it was just a pretty cool sequence. Like, when I was a kid, I, I really didn't care for like, oh, they're not at the parks. I, I don't like this. I skip fast forward, but I'm like just looking like, ah, oh, I kind of uh, appreciate the effort put into this. Now they have a, a much more um, have a have a lot more appreciation for uh, puppet work, having done puppets for cosplay. Yeah. It's something I kind of wish I learned how to do when I was a little bit younger. Because you watch any of the old specials with Jim Henson explaining puppetry, and it, it's really one of those things where, even as a child, I probably could have done it if I had just the right tools and the motivation. It seems odd that I did not do that. Although it's weird. I think I, I vaguely remember having a Pinocchio puppet. Like a marionette style? No, like a hand puppet. Oh, that's kind of neat. It has the weirdest random memory just popping in my head. 
Hmm, what other um, plot threads were there? I think we've covered most of the main ones. Yeah, most of the ones that we can remember off the top of our heads and like the main st- story story focus. And then they all meet up at the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular. With Kermit gets cast as Indy and Miss Piggy gets cast as, well, I guess Marion, even though Marion ish really dress her they up just like say that like we need a peasant woman and then Beauregard just like just pushes her off to the side like like yeah you're gonna you're gonna be starring in this because she's doing Marion roles because she gets kidnapped she get the is there in the airplane but she they don't dress her up to look anything like Marion so it's I'm getting more woolly vibes off of her yeah oh well, for sure but you know Kermit they put the hat on and he has the gun and he's the whole like I don't like violence and I'm like I'm yeah, pacifist I'm, Indy I'm, I don't, and every time, like, one of the stunt people gets shot or, or, you know, an explosion happens, it's like, you guys okay? And it's just like, they all just, like, get up and, like, thumbs up and stuff like that. Yeah, it was this and the step-by-step um, ABC special that introduced me to the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular. And when I, we oh, made our... Oh, God. Tr- we're, again, where they cast someone as Indy, which is not how they do it in real life. Or at least not how they do it in real life now. I don't know. Maybe back in the day, they're like, hey... Do you want to be put into really dangerous positions? It'd be really great, wouldn't it? And you're a stunt person. Um, you're a stunt person aficionado for stunt shows. I love stunt shows, yeah. And um, how do you rate the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular? It was uh, different than I was expecting because it set up more like, uh, how's the way to say this? Like explaining how stunts work in Hollywood, but then you also get a really good stunt show. I mean, they have pyrotechnics. You got a big old airplane on there. There's some trucks. They have amazing set they pieces. They change the set pieces around from a cave that's basically trying to do the opening of Raiders to the village, to the uh, village of Cairo, Cairo, right? Cairo-ish. Cairo, yes. Their Cairo-ish village and then the uh, German uh, military camp. So it's kind of interesting how they have all those sets on this really huge stage. They get people in, inter- integrated in, but not in like a cheesy way. Like I thought they were going to do the whole like... More like a melodrama where someone just has to say ooh or ah or whatever. But no, no, no. They were there while the you know fight was going on and they were just there to you know scatter when you know the bad guys showed up and what have you. And it was really cool. They were like they showed like the, the like yeah, this ground we have here is actually padding and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that's kinda cool. You learn something, but you're watching a fun, exciting show. Uh the the whoever was playing Indy in there did a pretty decent Harrison Ford. And the gal they got to be uh Marion did a pretty good uh oh god Karen Allen. Karen Allen. So I, I really did appreciate that. I mean, you know, I was like, are we going to live in that world where like Indy is just a real person who just happens to be working here on this set for no reason? I mean, that'd be stupid. And they're like, oh, this is John Johnson. He's Harrison Ford's stunt double. I'm like, who time traveled 40 years to get here? <laughs> but but still, I, like, I appreciated that, especially explaining what a stunt double is, what they do, the type of stunts. Like, I really, I really like that. It's not how they show it on step by step or in, in this special and the special it just seems like they just push one set with a gun and go 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 for it buddy you know what you're doing and that's not how they do it in the show but i i like that it was fun to seeing it well one the only other time i ever got to see indie kermit as indie was in muppet babies same here so being able to see kermit as indie again is actually kind of awesome to me and i'm like oh yeah, yeah seeing cool. grown-up kermit as <laughs> indie <laughs> and real- just Playing pacifist Indiana Jones. <laughs> like, occasionally just accidentally shooting the gun or something. Be like, oh, God, I'm sorry. And I just like the commentary they make. Like, when the when the sword guy, like, does his stunt fall yeah. very, very elaborately, Piggy's like, like, oh, I thought I was the one who was overacting. <laughs> and then you see, like, Piggy in the plane just kind of, like... Gunning everyone down. <laughs> I'm like, I'm okay with this. Don't touch my frog. <laughs> And then the big guy, you know, the German the, the repairman mechanic, man. Yeah, the the German mechanic uh, is up there. And Kermit's like, uh, and this piggy's like, step aside. Hi-ya! Just knocks him out of the way. I love Piggy. So great. <laughs> I keep forgetting like how much I really like her because like I always because my the the base memory I have with Miss Piggy was a um, Muppet Baby is Miss Piggy. She acts almost exactly the same. True, but I remember her just kind of being like more. They played her vain side a lot, a lot more up. I mean, yeah, she still still is pretty vain here, but like I just keep forgetting how badass she really you know, is. Look at baby, she's also pretty violent too. She she threatens everyone. This is true, 
Like, well, she what's the like, producer's job? They fired a director. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the producer on Star Wars? Uh, for sure, sure, sure. Oh. Which, which one? Uh, 77. Um, Lucas directed and produced, but he was also teamed up with two, one or two other people as producers, including his wife, I think. Mm. I think Marsha Lucas is a director on that. I'm not certain. I know she was an editor on it, and she helped save the film. Anywho, so, Huck, Derby security guard finds them. <laughs> I mean, eventually, they all get back together. Like, all right, let's go back to the swamp. And security guard shows up. He's like, uh, 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 you guys broke into Disneyland. You're, I'm calling Mickey and having all of you arrested. And then Kermit's like, yeah, Mickey and I go back. We're part of, like, the, um, what was it? Like, the Fictional f- Animal Actors Association or something like that. Like FOSA or something? Yeah. FOSA. Not quite the FAFSA. <laughs> so they all go and um, decide to go meet Mickey. Piggy, she sold her peasant robes from the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular. And then Beauregard's like, hey, uh, yeah, can I get my personal read, Beauregard? Just leaves for a second. And after everyone comes in to meet Mickey, who's animated Mickey, not person in suit Mickey, which is like such an odd choice. And yet I'm like, I'm perfectly fine with this. Why not? And then Miss Piggy makes her entrance all sparkles and everything and like perfect because it's Miss Piggy and that's what she does. And I like how um, Mickey and Kermit just decide to talk about their philosophies. Like, Mickey's all, all like, yeah, when you wish upon a star, your dreams will come true. And then Kermit's like, uh, someday you'll find a rainbow connection, lovers, dreamers, and me. And I, I forgot who it was. I think it was Fox. Like, oh, no, they're arguing philosophies. It is on. I think it was the members of the band saying that. Because mm. that feels like something the members of the band would say. It was just, it's kind of a cute little ending there. They all end kind of in the swamp again, eating, well, Gonzo's eating the bugs because it's Gonzo. Well, first, before they go to the swamp, we can't forget that they have one musical number all around Disney Oh, that's right. World. They do the, um, they go to Chinese theater to put their paw, pr- paw prints in, mm-hmm. uh, and, um, d- d- and sign off. And I believe you can find them there. Um, when we were at Disney World, like, it, it didn't cross our mind to check out the, um, Muppets, um, autographs. At uh, the Chinese theater, I didn't even go over all of them. I was looking for one specific person. You were looking I was for some dick. Certain was there, and I found him, and I was very, very, very happy. Warren Beatty, uh, the actor who played Dick Tracy, which is a movie that for some reason had a huge impact on my childhood, and to this day still does. It's one of my favorite cosplays to wear. And rewatching that movie, I'm like, I love this movie. Uh, it, it is campy, but it's meant to be campy. It's not like, oh, look how they couldn't even do a good... All the action scenes are done really well. The kid isn't obnoxious. And all the, the, the makeup and stuff they did for all the actors looks great. And, oh my god, is like Madonna like way too hot for her own good. And this is like peak Madonna. Yeah. This is like my favorite era of Madonna, because if you follow me on my fashion Instagram, you know I'm into retro clothing. Like, I would say Madonna, like, back then was, like, my style icon. Like, yeah, I wanted to dress in, like, those 1930s outfits, uh, 1940s outfits when she did A League of Their Own. All those uh, 40s outfits when she did Evita a couple years later. Mm -hmm. So, like, Madonna was always, like, my retro style icon. Like, even her when she did this used to be my playground video where she just is herself wearing retro clothes. It's like... Yeah, like, this is what got me into, like, vintage fashion. Um, not a lot of um, people I know, like, in the Dapper Day scene or in the pinup scene, um, mention Madonna as part of their vintage style icons, but she's, well, like, my she number one style, style icon. <laughs> Anywho, but, yeah, they all go back to, they all go back to the swamp, they do their thing, they watch the fireworks from the swamp, but, like, where is Miss Piggy? Oh, she was still signing autographs while her footprints were still stuck in cement. And it just at the credits, it's just Miss Piggy just welded to the uh, to the the cement because she was sitting there for too long. <laughs> it's and roll credits, screaming for help while the park is completely empty because it's night. And they do close those parks relatively early, comparatively down here, because they close at, what, 9 over there? 10? Yeah, they close at 9, nine out there, and yeah. they start the fireworks at 9, because I guess they kind of want, like, everyone to be, like, watching as the park is closing, and everyone's, and when everyone exits, uh, you see the uh, characters uh, wave goodbye, or the goodnight kiss, yeah. um, as people leave and bum rush for the uh, buses. Which is cute. I, I like the fact they do things like that. That's... 
Nice. And our mentality out out west is okay. We gotta leave before the fireworks or an hour after the fireworks because I want to avoid that bum rush of getting home. Yeah, you either gotta get. It's like okay, fireworks started at nine at eight eight thirty or whatever. You're like we're leaving at eight. <laughs> get out of here at eight, or you wait till nine thirty or ten. Whereas in Florida, because we're staying there as tourists, like we don't have to worry about getting to the parking lot. And um, waiting forever at Mickey and Friends or having to deal with crazy drivers at the Mickey and Friends yeah, lot. Yeah, plus the buses come often enough, you're never going to really be in too much trouble. Although I really liked at Villains Night with the, the goodbye there for, uh, you know, it was Lady Tremaine and uh, the, the stepsisters. And they're and like, wait. Is Gaston who? there? I think Gaston yeah, Gaston's there. there. Yeah, and, some um, gal in the, in the group going, like, Gaston, Goo. you're my favorite. Yeah, and Goo from... Um... Oh, yeah, Goo from uh, Meet the Robinsons. That was such a weird, like, thing to bring out but i'm glad i introduced you and deb and a few others to meet the robinsons because it's it's really underrated it, it's really good and it has a great line keep moving forward largely said by walt disney yeah and i that is one of my personal after i saw that i didn't see it in theaters i saw it like on hbo or something like that and, and whatever probably some summer when i was just sitting around and had the tv on and at the end i was like i like that keep moving forward that's a, it's a good motto to have and it's just walt disney and i'm like Oh, that's an even better motto to have. Yeah, highly underrated movie. I was given the opportunity on a date to watch Meet the Robinsons at the El Capitan Theater, but I was like, yeah, this doesn't really look like my kind of thing. I'm not really into... It was like during the era, era where I wasn't really... I was had my jaded Disney kind of feeling. The movies around that time were not that good. I mean, this is also the era of Chicken Little, which I did see in theaters, and that is a regret. So I'm like, um, hard pass. But I'm kind of glad that you did show it to us because, like, hey, this is actually better than it really needs to be. And, like, more people need to watch this movie. Yeah, it starts a little slow, but once things start get going, it, it gets crazy and fun. And it's and just like one of those ones family. where, like, weird, eccentric family that just really cares about each other. And I love that. Mm-hmm. So, overall, what did you think of this special? It was cute for what it was. It, it's kind of weird that, like, again, it makes it seem like all the parks are melded into one just giant city. Because I was which, also which thinking is, about that, but too. Not, I mean, you'd have to take trains, not trains, uh, buses monorails. or something, or a monorail or something to get around between boats. these parks. or Yeah, boats in some cases. And this is just the era where it's like the MGM was brand new, I think, at this state. You were talking about that. Yeah, it was like maybe one or two years old. And the Muppets did have like a presence in 1990. They had like this live stage show, but it was like Cringy. suit characters playing the Muppets. So it's like almost like watching the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> because like seeing like a human. <laughs> it's like coming out of their shells tour. <laughs> it's like seeing Kermit, a suit actor in a Kermit outfit, just kind of feels really odd to me. Like, just seeing, like, a six foot tall Kermit, like, that would freak me out. Yeah. And it's not until. that large for people in the back rows. And then, like, it's not till like, a year later in 1991, you would have Muffet Vision 3D open in, um, over at MGM. You know, all this being said, um, I'd still take that Muppet show over that garbage tier Star Wars fashion show thing they had. Yeah, that Star Wars fashion show is long gone. Yeah, that, that thing was garbage tier, and it annoyed me that it even existed. But I, I didn't like how it was blocking the view of the Chinese theater, because when you're walking... That stage is weirdly positioned. Yeah, it's like right in front of the Chinese theater, and the thing I expect to see when I'm walking straight into MGM Studios is the iconic Chinese theater. Not, not some fold-up stage? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And luckily, because of now running away railways there, they got rid of the um, stage. And oh, thank goodness. Yeah, it's no longer there. So, oh, happy day. Yeah. But it looked like that show was on that stage. Because that looked like that stage to me. And those that, that show is pretty cringe. It's better than a stupid Star Wars fashion walk-on. But it's it's not, not by much. I mean, at least it has the characters being silly... And then you have some rock songs by Electric Mayhem. It's, it's fine what it is. It would it would kill a few minutes in the Florida sun. Rather watch Veggie Veggie Fruit Fruit, but hey, that's me. Yeah, so one of the things I was just kind of like just thinking about just watching this having gone to Disney World. like, oh, wow, that's a lot of park hopping they do. <laughs> And especially just trying to get a get away with it because like wait how would you like and because you have to like enter through through those turnstiles again if you're going to go to Magic Kingdom mm -hmm. and into Epcot and like my brain logic was just kind of like 
Because when you're watching it as a kid, you don't really think of it because they try to do everything very seamlessly. Because you see them go through the gates of MGM at the beginning, and then you see, like, Benson and Beaker, oh, they're over in Future World. You see um, an Electric Mayhem, and they're on the double-decker bus over a World Showcase. Yeah, it's like a group of them somehow teleported from Hollywood, Hollywood Studio, MGM Studios at the time to just Epcot, and you're like, and then Afrazi's off at, at Magic Kingdom. Any other thing he's... And then, of course, um, Bernard and uh, Miss Piggy are going between all three parks, I think, based on the... And they're going back and forth between Magic Kingdom and uh, uh, MGM, because Star Tours is MGM, but Teacups and Big Thunder are over at <laughs> Magic Kingdom. Because back, back during the day, like, Epcot wasn't really, like, the e-ticket place. That was, like, for the Discovery Channel kids. Mm-hmm. I PBS why, kids. I think that's why they needed the characters to go there and make it seem like it was kind of a cool location. Like, the band was super happy to be able to tour the world. Uh, you know, Bunsen and Baker were just messing around and Swedish Chef's doing some Swedish... You know, basically doing what... He's doing the prototype of the Food and Arts Festival. Yeah, I said it. He started that. That, that They deserve all that credit. Swedish Chef. We salute you, Swedish Chef, and you will bound as Swedish Chef the first time we ever do, like, a food festival at Epcot. Yeah. I'll figure it out for you. I have an apron. You actually do have a legit uh, food and wine festival apron. I do have a food and wine festival apron to go along with my my generic apron I use for Captain Cook, the greatest of all Star Wars characters. Like, when I was watching as as a kid, like, I wanted to see, like, the Muppets, like, do more attraction-based things or, like... Because I thought that's where it was going to go. Yeah, that's how I was going to go, too, like... Okay, Fozzie's telling jokes and what and whatnot, but I thought like, like he would be Bears doing is right. Oh, yes, there. it's he, right there, Fozzie. Turn to the left. Like he would be doing like a show, like maybe at the Diamond Horseshoe or over at the Country Bears. Like you said, I like the, I like the idea of him like being an opening act for it. Yeah, I thought that's what he was gonna do. It was like offer to be that, and then you could have Statler and Waterf at the whatever the location is. They're heckling him, and I'd be and like. I was having a lot of fun, like, watching this as a kid, like, watching Beauregard and Piggy just kind of going around, like, all the rides at uh, Disney World, Mm -hmm. or what rides it could film them on. It's like, yeah, that actually does make me excited to, like, ever check out Walt Disney World one of these days, and we did last year. Because, like, at the end of the day, this is a commercial for Disney World. Yeah, totally. It totally is. Because, like, yeah, like, hey, you can also, did you know we also had a kennel here where you can, like, take your dog to... (laughs) So at the end of the day, like, yeah, it is a commercial for Disney World, but it's an enjoyable commercial. Yeah, because it's not like them going like, gee, Mr. Eisner, all these rides are so much fun. I would love to do this, but I can't do it all in one day. Oh, I know, Kermit. But thankfully, there's the brand new multi-day pass that people can buy for, let's see, at that time period, the them the money, eighty nine ninety nine per person. Sounds about 1990 prices, right? Ish. Like, they were talking, like, early 90s. I remember it was, like, around $90, like, mid to late 90s for an annual pass for our park here. Oh, man. <laughs> I want to pay $90 for an annual and pass. that was high tier. That was considered high tier back in the late 90s. God, no wonder everyone in my family had the highest tier pass. It cost nothing. I grew up poor, but we had certain luxuries, and when I was at the end of my high school time, that was one of the luxuries, and damn, is that a good one. And you were just totally wrecking up DCA during that time. Oh, yeah, I just felt like it was my park. Like, no one's here? Cool. <laughs> me, me and my friends would just, just go on rides multiple times over. It was wonderful. Especially if you got to know some of the staff people. We went on uh, Grizzly River like three times in a row. We went on a uh, 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 California Coaster, I think it was called. California originally. Screaming. California Screaming. We went on that like multiple times in a row, and they'd always be like, "Dude, just just sit, just don't worry, just just, just chill." <laughs> I love the fact that like, the staff just kind of recognizes us at a certain point. Like, oh, it's you guys. Anywho, if you have a chance, do check out the uh, Muppets at Walt Disney World special again. You can Google Google it. You can. F- it, I know you can't find it on Disney Plus, but it's a rare special, and like, if you're a fan of the parks. Definitely give it a watch. If you're a fan of the Muppets, definitely give this a watch again. This is Jim, one of Jim Henson's uh, final projects before his passing. In fact, um, he passed like a couple days after this had aired on NBC. So rest his soul. Yeah. 
All right, so we don't know how long this whole quarantine thing is gonna gonna last. Like so far, Disney has not made any announcements to extend it extend beyond April first, but a lot of us had the gut instinct feeling that they will. Yeah, it'll go on. I think till May. I think so too. I'm pretty hesitant on getting tickets for Villains Night because that's happening towards the end of April. Well, even if you do, that if they postpone it, they're just gonna give you a new date. This is true, but honestly, I just rather wait till I know for sure that Villains Night is happening because that's $200 I'd rather just kind of keep in my pocket cuz again, who knows how long this can last or versus dropping it on something that may or not happen. Well, the thing is, I'd like me, to have $200 accessible. Because I've been spoiled by East Coast Villains Night, I have almost no interest in going to West Coast Villains Night. All right, it's just me and Candace, let's go. Yeah. But you probably need to go to review food. Yeah, I know. Or an excuse to wear a Riku around the park. Yeah. But I know East Coast Villain Night, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. But I'm kind of curious how they're going to do it here out here on the West Coast. It's now at a DCA, right? Yes, it's going to be at DCA. So they probably could bring back the uh, little maze thing they did for Halloween maze. I really like the Halloween maze. So that's one of the reasons, like, okay, if they bring back the Halloween maze, totally in. Yeah, it's almost one of those points where I want the report, but but you the tickets will be sold out by the time someone reports what they're going to have. So. And it's not like they're doing this for like multiple nights. They're only doing it for one night yeah, because no. when they did for Sweetheart's Night, at least I can see what to expect. Uh, that was, it's not my thing. Anyways. Yeah, it's not my not really my thing. But I like. I'd rather have gone to Pixar Night, but I'm glad we did Indiana Jones instead. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, Pixar Night looked looked like it could have been fun. Yeah. But um, I'm also glad that we did Indiana Jones. That was also pretty fun too. Just kind of being like in the same world as like, oh hey, there's indie fans here Honestly, and there's park fans. The, the indie loaded Dole Whip thing was freaking amazing and one of the best things I've ever eaten. Yeah. Had to quickly just for one day of Lent just uh, break my Lent sacrifice. Like, I guess I could just have a Pocky. I miss Pocky. I used to have that way more often and I have not had it. I mean, outside of that, I, I can't remember the last time I had Pocky. It's not like it's a snack. I, it's not a go-to snack for me. But, we, like, almost in my household, or I always had friends who had it around, or just conventions were just, like, gave it away. And, and I do kind of miss just always having a box around just in case. I don't know. It's a weird, weird little thing. So, again, we're not sh- quite sure how long this is going to last. I Like, we're very sure that Disneyland out here is going to extend beyond the April 1st deadline. I mean, they're already canceling um, bookings for Disney World to that are booked up to June 30th. Yeah. And that was like a weekend I thought about hitting up the parks because like, oh, hey, I might be in the Florida area during like the last weekend of June. But I'm like, eh, probably best that I don't book it. However, a couple of ideas we had like for reviews kind of on the same vein as Muppets at Walt Disney World. Um, we could always talk about Kirk Cameron does the Tower of Terror. No, I want to do that one whatever 35th anniversary special or whatever it is where they have all the ABC characters just going to the park and not in the horrible, disgusting TGIF way, but in like in the funny Tony Danza's having like the worst trip on the Jungle Cruise possible. Oh uh, yeah. With uh, Charles Fletcher, voice of Roger Rabbit as the uh, Jungle Cruise skipper. Uh-huh. And uh, the, the, the Cheers character is talking about how much they love Disney, which I'm like, sure. Yeah. That's what Bostonians talk about all the damn time. And you know what? You know, I was put on the Disney special. Yeah, it's the anniversary. And that was like my first intro to Cheers. You met Goofy? Oh, that's great. And then I didn't start watching Cheers until its reruns were on Hulu. And now I can kind of uh, get that humor that they're going for. It. Also, us having lived in Boston for several years. It stands up. Definitely. But Jack and Diane are the worst couple of all time. I, <laughs> I hate I, them as a couple. They're insufferable. I have choice words. The will they won't they of season one was great, and then season two of them being together is just terrible. I, I just want to push both of them off a cliff. Yeah, will they won't they is way more fun. That's the reason why like Moonlighting had five seasons or whatever. It's the will they won't they works a lot better than it does if you put them together because you realize together they'd be a terrible like couple because they're the reason why they're the will they won't they is because of how different of people they are, and then as soon as they're together it's like yeah this doesn't work because you. Or two are not compatible. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Jay, take us out. 
All right, thank you for listening. If you have requests for Disney specials or anything else random Disney or theme park related you'd like us to cover on the next episode of Escapade, please leave a note in the comments. We will be glad to read it. Of course, check out our uh, um, description for links to the Magic Candle Company, who is one of our sponsors. They make the uh, most magical sense on Earth. Sorry about that. It we just got our dry. mouse waffles and our terror sense. Um, they just got in today. I'm very excited about them. And in addition to that, we also have our Ko-Fi, which you can just throw a few shekels in there. It will help us in the long run. Right now, it's just going to kind of sit in our bank accounts, but it will be utilized eventually for snacks, food, and etc. I hope. And I hope soon, because I'm hoping that this thing will go and I can actually talk about fun stuff at the park again because that's kind of more of what I enjoy talking about. And it's been such a nice we've been having such nice weather for the past couple of days. I'm just kind of looking at the weather yeah, outside. Kind of off rain. I like the rain. I like seeing indoors rain but when I say like oh it's a nice day outside the weather's nice it's like it's theme park weather which I was looking at it's like uh boys and very F festival uh, could have been this weekend that was rough. Uh. But honestly, shout out to like everyone who has been commenting on our boys and very festival uh photos on our Instagram and also have commented on our uh, last video um, that we posted last Friday. Yeah, keep the engagement up. We love hearing from you. And again, if there is like a Disney Park special you'd like us to talk about, it, mention that in the comments. Because, um, yeah, um, we're homestuck and just give us something to do. Until next time, remember to eat the magic. <laughs>